Welcome back to Supply Chain Broadcast. This is episode three. This week, we visit Nyeri County to see the first stages of the coffee supply chain. Nyeri is known as the best Kenyan coffee region due to its fertile soil and the temperate climate. Yeah, that's what Daniel was telling us at the coffee exchange last week. That's true. Nyeri is also Kikuyu land. They're the largest tribe in Kenya known for their skill with the earth and natural systems. But how did the Kikuyu get involved in farming coffee in the first place? As the Kikuyu had knowledge on the land, so British during 1900s forced them to grow coffee as a cash crop. Still, most of the coffee industry is run by the Kikuyu. So the first Kenyan coffee farmers had no choice in the matter. The practice has been handed down through generations. Let's go meet one of the younger generation of farmers who's still carrying on. After that, we'll find out about the first logistical stages of the supply chain. The wet and dry mills where coffee cherries are hauled to collect green beans. We left Nairobi by car early in the morning. We drove three hours to the north through the suburbs towns, villages, past a huge pineapple farm, and through ancient forest. We picked up Kanaru at the village and headed to his farm and his house. Kanaru is in his mid-thirties and his coffee farm is the small holding with the roughly 50 trees. The dogs were running around and the hot January sun shone down on the first white flowers of the coffee trees as we stepped onto the hillside field. Since lots of Kenyans speak three languages, English, Swahili, and tribal languages, I thought he also might speak English or Swahili, or I imagined using Google translators in between, because that's how our generations make conversation between people who speak different languages. But he was only speaking Kikuyu, which was not even mentioned in the Google translator. I also thought he might have access to the internet and through what we heard at the coffee exchange that he might already know about the supply chain in some capacity. Fortunately, our Kenyan friend is also Kikuyu, so he was able to translate. As usual, we asked Kanaru our questions. How, How much time, time do you have, you have for breaks? breaks? What, what do, do you, you do, do in this time? This time? Kanaru said that he had between five and six hours of his own time each day. How do the seasons affect your work? Because of the pretty extreme cold seasons experienced in Nyeri, around seven degrees Celsius, the coffee can be burnt and not ripen properly. That's what happened last season. So there was only a ton of coffee in the harvest. Kanaru knows that pesticides exist to mitigate these issues, but he's not sure which to use. When, when do you, you feel fulfillment, fulfillment in, in your work? work? Fulfillment is felt when they get a better price for their coffee. Last season they got 50 shillings per kg, which is about 45 euro cent. Even Kanaru's father, who he runs the farm with, told him that that was a big amount and that he had done well. How do you adjust, adjust your, energy, your level energy level to, to the, the working, working rhythm? rhythm? It's a cycle. You wake up in the morning and you have a big cup of tea. It's no longer about coffee on the coffee farms. You have to find a rhythm in your work. And once you find it, it's hard to leave the shamba. What do you chat about? Between your colleagues. It's all about cooperation. 
Kanaru has a friend who works on a neighboring farm, but they decided that today they will work on Kanaru's. So it's not about payment, but rather the local workload. For example, soon the manure needs to be spread, so other farmers and locals will come to help. There is still a strong sense of community here. Do you feel a connection to the rest of the supply chain? Kanaru understands the whole local process of wet mill, but it doesn't add value to their lives. At some point, he says, the supply chain just disappears. Once you do your deed as a farmer, of selling your beans onto a local cooperative, that's it. What would you say, say to another, to member, another of the member of the supply chain? A question, a greeting, a random thought. In terms of connection to the rest of the supply chain, there is none. Kanaru knows nothing of the other end of the spectrum, so he can't even ask a question, because who's he going to ask? Our friend explains the Nairobi coffee exchange to Kanaru. The question he returns with is, who is eating the money? If a kilogram of processed beans goes for between 300 and 500 shillings on the exchange, why am I getting 30? Where does the money go? The local cooperative wet mill told Kanaru at the beginning of last season that his coffee was grade 1, which fetches a good price. But later, he was told it was grade 2. And he is being picky with his harvest, taking only the best beans to preserve the grade. Later, we moved up to the courtyard of Kanaru's house and started to chat with his family and fellow farmer over a cup of hot tea. We also shared the thoughts from baristas in Amsterdam and the coffee auction in Nairobi with Kanaru. Saad, a barista in Boca in Amsterdam, said, As a farmer, have you ever tasted your own coffee? After they've removed the husks, the coffee is gone. He's never drunk his own coffee before. Patrick, the owner of Monk's Coffee Roastery in Amsterdam, said, Do you enjoy doing what you do? How did you get into doing what you do? The rest of his siblings are in Nairobi, so it's only him and his father left to take care of the farm. One family member, at least, has to do it. Mm. Narezia, the owner of Daymaid, had asked, how does the working week look? Mm. Kanaro said that he spends two days a week preparing and working on the coffee, Monday and Tuesday. The rest of the week is devoted to raising cattle and other house chores. Kanaro's siblings were all went to the city for looking for other opportunity from farming, while Kanaru was staying in the farm. I was wondering about if he also want to go to city. But he said, he have a life here, he have a house, he know that have a farm and work and money to live, why he will go to the city? In terms of connection to the internet, fibre was recently introduced to the area, but it hasn't affected the transparency of the coffee supply chain yet. To answer Saad's question further, we also served some of the coffee we had brought with us. Yeah. We enjoyed it, having never tasted before, but prefer tea with milk. Kanaru then took us to the wet mill where he sells his coffee. It is owned and operated by a local cooperative. A wet mill factory is the process of cleaning, fermenting, drying and extracting the bean from the coffee cherry. It is an important part of the process of coffee. As Stephen from Coffee Auction mentioned, it could spoil the effort of farmers if it is not done correctly. Because it was not harvest season, the place was empty and we were able to take a look at the machinery. It's quite old and looks like it has been in use perhaps since the beginning of the coffee industry in Kenya. We got to see how the process of cleaning and hulling coffee cherries takes place. 
This is how green beans are extracted from the plant. The factory is located in a valley, meaning it has a constant supply of water with which to operate, and the sound of small waterfalls fill the air. Whilst walking around, we saw some signs with the Nescafe logo, telling workers how to select which cherries are to be accepted by the factory. So this is the first stage of the supply chain where multinationals have an influence. We dropped Kanaru back to his farm and drove back towards the main road. On the way there, I had spotted a sign for the Central Kenya Coffee Mill, which Peterson at the coffee exchange had told us we should visit. It is a dry mill. This part of the process involves grading green coffee beans and moving them to the warehouse for a storage before they are purchased on the exchange. The mill is regulated by multinational certification bodies and a high level of cleanliness is maintained. Speaking with Timothy, who is a field marketer, we heard that the mill runs educational programs with farmers to help them improve the quality of their beans. The factory pretty much uses one machine which shakes the beans to sort them into grades. Laborers then load the beans into sacks of 60 kgs and carry them into trucks. The mill itself is heavily protected by military grade security, as in the past there have been thefts of green beans. Our visit was unscheduled, which was not how the mill usually operated. They expected us to have an appointment. In the waiting room we were served coffee, whilst all the Kenyan guests had tea. This reminded me of the fact that Daniel, the CEO of the coffee exchange, said he preferred tea to coffee, and that Kanaru and his family had never drunk coffee and only drank tea. Tea is definitely the hot drink of choice in Kenya. Supply Chain Broadcast Season 1 Coffee Well, that was an amazing day exploring the coffee supply chain in Nyeri County. It was, especially as I grew up in the city, visiting farm was very, very nice and interesting. Did you have any reflections on the day? I felt strange to arrive with a camera electronics device when we couldn't even speak his language. But it seemed like he had a good time and wanted to take a photo with us and is very open to starting a bigger conversation with more local farmers, he mentioned. I really appreciate. Yeah, that was great. What you thought, Luke? Whilst talking to the farmers, I felt strange about showing the footage we'd taken in Amsterdam and Nairobi. It made me think, do they really need to be connected to the global market through the supply chain? In my research, I've been thinking about the supply chain as a way that a free market orientated society is spread to new locations. Is this really what a rural farmer in Kenya needs? After all, they have food from the farm and a good community surrounding them. The clear benefit to the farmer would be receiving a fairer rate for their coffee beans. They most certainly are more aware of the ways of the earth and have a stronger connection to it than someone at the other end of the chain. Really, I think the people who need to learn from this whole supply chain are the people at the other end and along it. Let's see how it goes by listening to other people as well. Yeah, I agree. But there's definitely a lot of knowledge at the farm. Definitely, for sure. He know how to deal with the environment. That's it for today's episode of Supply Chain Broadcast. Thanks to everyone who helped to make it possible. Where are we going next, Juhi? Next time, we're going to Nanyuki to check flower farm which have a different process from coffee. It should be an interesting contrast to the way coffee is farmed. It's a side episode that we're not going to talk about coffee, but it is different type of supply chain, so tune in us. Tune in. Thank you for listening, thank you for joining us, and thank you for make it happen. 
you can subscribe to Supply Chain Broadcast on iTunes, on SoundCloud, and also you can follow us along on YouTube and Instagram at Supply Chain Broadcast. We also support the subtitle of Dutch, Korean, and Swahili. And you can also visit our website www.supplychainbroadcast.net.